Hey everybody and welcome back to my channel. So today's case is one that I feel like a lot of you might have a strong opinion on. I know that the vast majority of you always leave very sweet and kind comments, but for the very small fraction of you who feel the need to comment anything negative about these cases, I ask that you please keep your opinions to yourself in this specific case because they are just not necessary. I say this because this case does involve a young man who was trying to find his place in the world and fell into things that he probably shouldn't have been involved with and made a lot of decisions that maybe a lot of us wouldn't have made. And we can't personally judge someone for taking certain actions when we don't know them personally and we don't know what they've been through and this young man has been through a lot and so has his family. I am making this video to spread awareness about this case because I believe that this case needs a lot more exposure than it has gotten and his disappearance seems so close to being solved that I think that maybe by spreading his name out there and story out there even more will push someone, the necessary person, to come forward with what they know. So with all of that being said, let's just get right into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Max Greenfield. Max Greenfield grew up in a small town in Oregon called Brookings. Brookings is a quiet, small rural town where everyone knew everyone. He was described as being soft-spoken and kind, yet strong-willed and wanted to live by his own rules. He was very creative and wanted to go out and do big things, so he didn't feel like he fit into the small town that he grew up in in Brookings and always wanted to pursue a career in art, either just across the board in California or maybe even New York. I found this painting on his Facebook and you can just tell that he loved abstract and colorful art. I absolutely love paintings like this, so I was really impressed when I saw this piece. Now, Max was born into a pretty seemingly normal family, but him and his older sister, Tanya, were actually 12 years apart in age. Even so, the two were extremely close and spent a lot of time together as he was growing up. They had such an amazing bond and Tanya absolutely adored her little brother. After graduating high school in Brookings when he was 17 years old, Max went down to Southern California where he attended a few different colleges and then headed over to New York. After spending some time in New York, he ended up back in Oregon and went to school in Portland for graphic design. His sister described Max as sort of a wanderer who didn't really know where he wanted to be, but he did know that he wanted to explore. He knew that he wanted to be successful and to travel the world and to do so many different things that he didn't quite have a specific career in mind that he wanted to do for the rest of his life. Just like so many people his age, he had a passion for so many things in life that he couldn't just stick to one place doing one thing. So he ended up moving back to Brookings with his family and that is where he ended up staying for quite some time. Now, like I said, Max knew that he wanted to be successful and he would go to school and he would do very well while he was there. But then he would sort of get bored and he didn't really want to stick to that one thing and then he would quit. He would start jobs and then quit shortly after. Every time he went somewhere like California or New York to be independent, he didn't really know how to take care of himself so he couldn't really make it out on his own and always ended up coming back home to his family. Then after you know going out and trying these new things, but then always ending up back home, he would feel hopeless and helpless and depressed and ended up not wanting to do much of anything. However, Max had a lot of underlying mental health problems, which he was not being treated for for quite a while. He had really bad anxiety and that's why he would quit his jobs almost right away. But then after he would quit these jobs, he got into these really, really low points of depression where he just felt like his life was going nowhere and he felt like he had no control over it. So like I said, Max grew up in this very small town and he didn't feel like he fit in there. Max was actually gay and as you can imagine, 
That just wasn't something that was widely accepted in his small, traditional town of woodsmen and fishers. Not only that, but when Max came out to his father, his father wasn't totally accepting of him either. They had a very strained relationship Max's entire life, and even more so after he came out as gay. His father did pass away some time after this, and I'm not exactly sure why it was some sort of health reasons, but obviously that had a huge effect on his mental health. But then, to add yet another thing on top of all of these other problems, at some point in his teen or early adult years, again, no one can really pinpoint exactly when, but Max started using drugs. Tanya said that she thinks that he got into more of the drug scene when he was in New York, and that's when the substance use really started. Again, Max had all of these mental health issues that were going untreated, so the best way for him to cope was to use these substances to self-medicate. The substance use got really bad and eventually escalated to him using heroin to cope. By 2013, he was admitted to a mental health facility and then to a detox center in 2017, but he never did make it into rehab. But even then, he was clean for quite some time. After he was clean, he went home to go live with his mother and he was on the right medications for his depression and anxiety. His mom and sister were huge advocates for his recovery. Every morning, his mother got his medications ready for him while locking the rest away to make sure he was taking the proper dose and no more, no less. But even though it seemed like he was clean and doing very well for quite some time, he once again started hanging out with the wrong crowd of people. And even though it isn't 100% confirmed, Max's family believes that he slipped back into using shortly before he disappeared at the age of 25 years old. Now, like I said, Max and Tanya were incredibly close and she cared so deeply for him. Even after Tanya moved out of the family home and was married, she still made it a point to spend as much time with him as possible. The weekend of Max's disappearance was no different. On Friday, March 16th, 2018, Tanya got off work and her and her husband at the time wanted to take Max to the movies down in Crescent City in California. But Max actually told them that he was at the Lucky 7 Casino in Smith River, California, which is just across state lines and is just a short drive away from Brookings, so he wanted them to meet him there. Tanya said that this was the place that Max always went because, again, Brookings was a very small town and there wasn't really anything to do there and there was no place near them that was open 24-7, so this was a place that he would frequently go, so it wasn't out of the ordinary that he was there. But by the time Tanya met him at the casino by 6 p.m., he said that he didn't really want to go to the movies. He asked her if she wanted to grab a beer, so the two grabbed a beer together. They spent a short amount of time there before he asked Tanya if she could take him back home, which she did, and he was back at home by 10.30 p.m. that night. He also told his sister that he would go to the movies with her on Sunday. That next day, Saturday, March 17th, was a pretty normal day as far as we know. Max's mom went to work, and as far as we know, Max just stayed at home all day. His mother got home from work, and then around 9 or 10 p.m. that night, she set his medications out on the counter for the next morning, and then she went to sleep. The next morning, March 18th, she woke up for the day, and she didn't see Max, and he hadn't taken his medications yet, but she just assumed that he was still sleeping since it was 6 a.m. in the morning when she left for work. However, little did she know that on the 9th of the 17th, after she went to bed, Max had actually gotten onto Facebook Messenger and started asking around for people to give him a ride to the Lucky 7 Casino. One of his friends eventually agreed to pick him up and give him a ride. Then, once he was there, he was messaging another friend, telling her that he was on his way and asking her if she was going to be there. This was at 11.40 p.m., according to the messages between Max and his friend. But then, once he was at the casino, the employees actually asked him to see his ID, 
which he did not have, so they just kicked him out. According to Max's sister, he didn't really have a lot of money and he was there hanging out with a lot of people who were known for doing drugs, so they were basically just trying to find an excuse to kick him out because he wasn't gambling, he wasn't spending his money, so they couldn't have him sitting in there. But either way, he was kicked out and he didn't have a car. He didn't have any way to get home, so he was just kind of stuck there. So as he was waiting outside, the cameras outside of the casino just kept recording and stayed pointed at him so that, you know, the employees of the casino could keep an eye on him and make sure that he actually left and make sure that he wasn't causing trouble outside. As he was waiting outside, cameras saw him using his phone and looking around as if he was waiting for someone. Then about an hour after he was kicked out at around 1.50 a.m. on Sunday, March 18th, cameras picked up a man wearing a leather jacket walking into frame who started talking with Max. As they were talking, the camera zoomed in onto a duffel bag that Max was holding in his left hand, which appeared to have a two liter bottle of pop, and in his right hand, he was holding his phone. As the two were talking, the man started walking away from the casino towards Highway 101, and Max followed. The cameras continue to watch the two men walking away towards the highway, and we can see this other man repeatedly looking back at something, but we don't exactly know what. Eventually, the two walked far enough out of view that you could no longer see them. But then, about 20 minutes later, the cameras picked up the man coming back to the casino, but Max was not with him. After this, Max has never been seen or heard from ever again. Now, later that day, Sunday, March 18th, Tanya started texting Max, asking him about their plans to go to the movies later that day. But of course, she got no response. She kept trying to get a hold of him, but he wouldn't answer. And honestly, she was getting very frustrated. The two had plans to go to the movies and she couldn't figure out why he wasn't responding, but she wasn't that worried because this is something that he did quite often just by not responding, even if they had plans. But then by 4 p.m., Max's mother got home, only to see Max's medications still laying out on the counter where she had left them the night before. She thought that this was strange, so she just called Tanya to ask him if she knew where he was, and of course, she didn't know either, and she was trying to get a hold of him all day. But still, they weren't completely panicked yet because they had just assumed that he had snuck out the night before to hang out with his friends and that he just didn't come back in time to take his pills, which is pretty much exactly what happened, so I understand why they thought that. They waited a little bit to see if he would come back and then they started asking around to see if anyone knew where he was, but when he didn't return back home the next day, they knew that something was wrong. Tanya went to Facebook to let people know that they were looking for Max and one of his friends actually reached out telling Tanya that she was supposed to meet him at the casino that night. It was the same friend that he had been messaging and trying to meet up with, but she said that he never showed up to the casino. So at this point, she was the last person known to have spoken with him and they had no idea what happened. So then by Tuesday, when he still hadn't shown up back home, they reported him missing to the Curry County Sheriff's Office. But as you can imagine, the police did not take this seriously at first because he was 25 years old, he had a known history of substance use, so it was assumed that he had just run away and that he would be returning soon. But they knew that he hadn't run away. Tanya said herself that he didn't have a job. He wasn't very independent. He had tried to leave several times, but had always returned home no matter what. 
he didn't have a job so he didn't have money. She knew that if he needed to be picked up, he would have called his mom and if she didn't answer, he would have called his sister. And she knew that he knew that Tanya would always be there to pick him up when he needed a ride. The two were afraid that police weren't going to do much, especially because he did go missing across county lines and in different states. So Tanya decided to do some digging of her own, so she decided to go through Max's Facebook messages. And that pretty much solidified that he was at the casino that night and had spoken to multiple people about it. So I also want to mention that Max's phone didn't work without Wi-Fi and he didn't have a phone number or anything like that. So Facebook Messenger and other platforms like that were his primary method of communication. So they brought these messages over to police and police did end up working with the Del Norte County in California and investigators went over to the Lucky 7 Casino to get a hold of the security footage from that night. It was after viewing this footage that police realized that he probably didn't just run off because they saw him walking off with this mystery man in this video. Within the first month of Max's disappearance, police and family had gone out and done several intensive searches. They brought out dogs to specific areas in California where they had received tips about something happening to Max, but dogs didn't react or find anything significant. Now, when Tanya saw the surveillance video of Max and this man, she immediately knew who this man was. It was a man named Jason Ledford who was in his 50s. Tanya immediately messaged him on Facebook and asked him what happened, but he said that he didn't actually see Max that night and that he didn't even know who Max was, which is super sketchy because as we know, there was surveillance video that picked up both of them together at the casino. So. Obviously, Tanya turned these messages into police who went on to question him as well. So when they questioned Jason initially, he continued to claim that he didn't see Max that night. When he was questioned the next time, he changed the story a little bit and said that he did kind of know of him, but that he doesn't know anything about the morning of March 18th. But of course, after he was shown the video of the two men walking away together, he once again changed his statement and said that he did see Max that night, but when they had walked away together, he wanted to go a different way than he did and he has no idea where he walked off after that. He continued to claim that he didn't really know Max that well and that, you know, they just had a brief conversation, but obviously Tanya doesn't believe this entire story and she said that he had changed his story several times after this. She said that in the video, after we see Jason returning to the casino by himself, he can be seen going into the casino and then going into a hallway in the casino and it looked like he was absolutely freaking out over something for an entire hour in that hallway. Tanya said that he kept going back and forth between saying that he doesn't have any idea what happened to Max to saying that he is scared that he will be harmed if he tells anyone what happened. So clearly it's starting to look like Jason knows what happened. Maybe he was responsible but for whatever reason, he's terrified. So just beyond the fact that this other man came in and spoke to Max just before he disappeared, there were other strange things about that night that they saw on the video as well. So as we saw earlier, he was carrying a duffel bag that night. Some people look at this and wonder if maybe he had planned on taking off and going somewhere else that night and starting a new life. Maybe he had packed a bunch of clothes and other personal belongings into this duffel bag so he could go off and do whatever. But his sister disagrees and she says that he was actually carrying around art supplies that night. She said that the girl that he was supposed to meet up with at the casino was a girl that he would often paint with. But the other strange thing that Tanya noticed about this video was that he didn't look like he was wearing his own clothes. She said that the clothes he was wearing that night were way too big for him and that they were literally falling off. He was not known to want to wear pants that were baggy, but he did go thrifting and, you know, got some unique pieces, so she thought maybe that could have something to do with it, but 
it stood out to her like a sore thumb that he was wearing these clothes because she just did not think that they were his clothes. It was something that was so strange to her that it immediately stood out to her. So going back to the girl that Max was supposed to meet that night, police questioned her and it turns out that Max and Jason were supposed to meet up with her that night and then go to her house. Jason had allegedly supplied heroin and meth for the night, and Tanya had messages proving that Jason actually admitted to this. So at this point, it's pretty much assumed that this entire situation is involving drugs for whatever reason. Now, Max didn't really have a criminal record. He was kind of known by police to be a user, but he was never involved in anything serious himself. However, the people who he associated with did have very extensive criminal histories, so there are a lot of people that could be involved in his disappearance that he was involved with before he disappeared. So over the following several months and continuing on to this day, police have been following a bunch of different leads and finding new players who could be involved. Investigators have said that the people that Max was with that night were known to be involved in some pretty serious drug use and some pretty serious criminal activity. Then those people know other people and those people know other people and it's this big entangled web of people who might be involved in not only Max's disappearance, but a bunch of other criminal activity. They have said that it's one of those cases where they know exactly who is involved. They know that it had something to do with drugs, but the more that they dig into it, and investigate. The more names are added to the list of suspects and the more possibilities they have. They are continuously receiving tips and people are constantly reaching out to Tanya. Police have continued to search different areas of the county and had followed several different leads. They said that they have several different theories, but every time they follow a different lead, it always takes them down a very, very similar path. So there are a couple of theories of what possibly could have happened to 25-year-old Max Greenfield the morning of March 18th, 2018. A lot of theories are based on Jason's involvement. People aren't sure whether he is directly involved, whether he's directly responsible, or whether he witnessed something or something like that. But I will say that later in the investigation, Jason went on to say that he was extremely close with Max and the other people that they had hung around with. He saw himself as sort of a father figure to them, I guess a father figure who apparently supplied heroin, but he said that he would never hurt Max and Tanya actually kind of believes him. She thinks that he was not someone that acted alone in hurting Max, but she definitely believes that he knows exactly what happened to her little brother, but is just far too afraid to come forward with any information that he knows. So, knowing all of this, let's get into the actual theories in this case. So, the first theory is pretty much that everything happened how it was said to have at first. So Max went to the casino. He was kicked out, but he stayed there and waited for Jason to get there. And then after Jason got there, they had planned to go to this girl's house to use drugs. But maybe when they had walked off camera, they had gone somewhere relatively close to shoot up, since we do know that Jason was only gone for about 20 minutes. And then maybe they were either with the girl that they were supposed to meet up with and she had just lied about never seeing him, or maybe they were with others, or maybe it was just the two of them shooting up. But some people believe that it's at this point that maybe Max accidentally overdosed and maybe whoever he was with freaked out and hit his body. Now, the area from Brookings to Smith River was known for heroin being laced with fentanyl. Fentanyl is very, very dangerous. Maybe the drugs that Jason was providing to these young adults were laced with fentanyl, and that is how Max died, and that's why he freaked out. Because if police knew that the drugs that Jason was providing with Max were laced with fentanyl and he knowingly gave them to Max and they directly caused Max's death, 
then he would be held responsible. Maybe he overdosed and Jason was just freaking out. So he went back to the casino to get away from the situation and think about what he was going to do next. And maybe that's why we saw him freaking out. Maybe he returned to get rid of Max's body later with help after he left the casino that night. Or maybe others came and did it for him while he waited at the casino. Either way, some people believe that this was an accidental overdose and Jason could have possibly seen it happen and that could have been why he was freaking out at the casino. The next theory is that Max was harmed. And within this theory, there are several different ideas to exactly why he was harmed. So obviously the first and biggest reason investigators believe that he was harmed is that it was related to something that had to do with drugs. Maybe there was some sort of altercation. Maybe he owed the wrong people money. We know that he didn't have a job and he didn't have money besides, you know, him asking Tanya and his mother for money, but somehow he was able to continue using these hard drugs. So maybe he promised to pay these people, but he didn't. So when he showed up that night and he was still expecting to use, but he didn't have the money, they were fed up and they got rid of him. These seem to be some very, very scary people that they are dealing with. Even police have said that they've had to search some places that are incredibly dangerous even for them. They said that there are some pretty big players here, so if it was money related, it isn't hard to believe that these big drug lords wouldn't take someone's life because they owed them a little bit of money. It could also be related to some sort of other altercation. Other possibilities within this theory are maybe that maybe some of these men were homophobic. With a lot of these cases, I do think this possibility should be considered, especially since we know that so many people are harmed simply because of their sexuality or because of their race or because of their gender or whatever other reason. There could have been some sort of altercation about that. Maybe these people didn't know that he was gay for the longest time and then when they found Found out they were really upset that they were supplying drugs to him. I don't know how that would have gone down, but I do think that it should always be considered. The other possibility that I heard an investigator involved in this case actually talk about in an interview is maybe there was a situation with him maybe flirting with one of the female friends' boyfriends or something like that. So there was a fight because of that. I don't exactly know why investigators believe that, but there has to be something pointing towards that if that is a possibility that they are considering. The investigator also mentioned that in both of the theories that involve an altercation, that it probably was some sort of accidental death where maybe they punched him way too hard and then he had a seizure and ended up dying that way. But in this theory, he believes that it was not purposeful. But with any of those reasons and theories, you have to imagine that all of these things happened extremely quickly since we know that Jason was only out of camera view for 15 to 20 minutes and he came back and he was freaking out over something. So I would imagine that people had to have come there prepared to fight or something escalated extremely quickly right away and maybe it happened and Jason just wanted to get out of there before it escalated even more. The other thing that pops into my mind related to this is that again, with the whole money idea. Maybe people knew that Jason was about to see Max, the same people who Max owed money to, so they forced Jason into the situation, or maybe, you know, Jason voluntarily went into it, but maybe because of the whole money thing, they kind of lured Max to Jason under the assumption that he was going to give them drugs, and then again, maybe because he feared his own life or whatever other reason, he agreed to lure Max in so that they could kidnap him and then take him and harm him. So maybe again, he lured Max in and then immediately met with these people who took Max away and then Jason was seen freaking out because he knows that he just handed off his friend, admittedly, to people who he knew were going to harm him. I don't really know if this is even viable, but I do know that it's something that could happen in terms of 
being involved with drugs. And I also want to consider the fact that Jason was not away from the camera for too long. So again, it has to have been something that freaked him out that happened in a very short period of time. Whatever the reason may be, many people, including investigators, believe that he was harmed in one way or another by someone involved in drugs that night. One investigator even went as far as saying that he knows who did it, he knows what happened, but he doesn't quite know why. His sister Tanya had also mentioned that she had received several Facebook messages from people who say that he was harmed and buried in one specific area, but when police eventually got a warrant to go and search that area, he wasn't actually there. So she believes that he was actually there, but then when they felt the heat from police and realized that they were not going to go away, that he was dug up and moved somewhere else. Obviously, they are on the coast, so Tanya also believes that it's possible that he could have been thrown into the water. She said that she's heard so many rumors about what could have happened to Max. So many people are reaching out to her, giving her information, and since this is a small town and word travels quickly, a lot of people know a lot of things. But at the same time, people are also terrified to give out information and risk their names getting out and being known that they're the ones who talked. Again, these people that are involved are very, very dangerous and they have a lot of people who are afraid of them. As I mentioned earlier, even Jason allegedly was freaking out saying that if he said anything, that he'd be harmed. Other people around the area are also terrified to talk in fear that they too will be harmed. Police have said that they know who knows what happened. They know that there are people out there who want to come forward, but they just have to sit there and wait that being involved in these serious drugs is going to prevent people from coming forward and people who are involved in these very dangerous people will make them too scared. But he thinks that once these people go to jail for something else and then they get clean, that he does think people will come forward and tell him what they know. At the end of the day, police are continuously finding new people to talk to. They are following new leads and coming up with new ideas all of the time. Obviously, there's always the theory that he could have just up and left that night or that he could have taken his own life, but that theory does not seem likely. If we didn't know what we knew about all of these people around town coming forward with what they know and all of these people that he could have been involved with, I would say that it does seem like a plausible theory since we know that he did have all of these mental health issues and he even was seen with a duffel bag with him, but we know too much to even entertain this theory. So I don't think that it happened whatsoever and I don't think that it's a plausible theory. This is one of those cases that I do truly have hope for. I do think that we will see this case being solved. It just sounds to me like this is a waiting game at this point. Police are just waiting for the right person to come forward with the information that they need to finally charge someone with Max's disappearance. This is also one of those cases where I feel like spreading Max's story out there and putting pressure on those involved might actually cause some movement in this case. We've done it before. I've actually had actual family lawyers reach out to me and tell me that my videos has actually made waves in their case and is causing some trouble for those thought to be responsible. So it can happen and that gives me even more motivation to continue making these videos, knowing that even if I am unaware, a lot of these videos and spreading information is actually making ripples. So as always, all I ask is that you guys share Max Greenfield's story and let as many people know about Max as possible. Let people know that we care about Max and we care about getting justice for him. Max's sister is out there fighting for Max every single day. She is truly his biggest advocate. It truly amazes me how much she's done for her little brother and is the biggest reason why Max's case even has hope to begin with. A lot of the information that I got for this video came directly from an interview that she did on The Vanished podcast and a lot of the information that police got 
was from her digging. And real quick, while I am on the topic, I did want to give a shout out to The Vanished Podcast for doing such an amazing job. And I got a lot of information for today's case using The Vanished Podcast. They had his sister on, they had multiple detectives involved in the case. So make sure you go ahead and check out that podcast if you do want to hear those interviews. But either way, my heart goes out to Tanya for her absolutely endless dedication for her brother and Max's mother for everything that she's gone through. She seemed to be doing her best to support her son through absolutely everything. Tanya said that her and his mother were absolutely 100% accepting of Max's sexuality, even when his father wasn't. She was doing what she could to get him help for his addiction and to keep him clean afterwards. She was doing everything that she could for her son. She literally laid out his medications every single day to make sure that he was going on the right path, make sure that he was healthy and that he was okay. But unfortunately this happened, but there is absolutely nothing that she could have done differently to prevent this. But I'm sure she's feeling really guilty about what happened. Even though this 1000% is nowhere near her fault, my heart is truly broken for both of them, and I desperately hope that they get the justice that they deserve soon. Max Greenfield is described as being a 25-year-old white male who is about 6 feet tall and weighs about 160 pounds. He had brown hair, blue eyes, and a skeleton key tattoo on his left forearm. Max was last seen wearing black jeans, a dark colored t-shirt, a black jacket, and black beanie. He's also been seen carrying his black duffel bag. If you have any information about Max's case, please call Detective Darren Gill at 707-465-2468. You can also contact the Del Norte County Sheriff's Office at 707-464-4191 or Curry County, Oregon Sheriff's Office at 541-247-3242. Both agencies accept anonymous tips, and all of this information will be linked down below. So that is all I have for today's video, and now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that Jason is responsible? Do you think that this was an accident? Do you think that there was some sort of altercation? Do you think this possibly could have been a hate crime? please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And as always, if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week and I hope to see you next time. Bye!